brief slide deck. Um, and I wanted to say thanks to all the, um, the organizers for the quick reorganization. I think this has really worked quite well. Um, I've learned a lot about um, some of the areas of eMERGE um, beyond discovery that I was a lot less informed about. I think that there's an enormous amount that the VA can learn. Um, we are um, developing our big data strategy in the VA, which crosses both research and um, clinical care. Um, you having built a, um, a um, genomic research infrastructure within the healthcare system. So a lot of the things that I've heard today are, are going to be very applicable. Um, we are at the, we, we're approaching a 250,000 um, individuals in MVP. Um, and um, as Neil had mentioned earlier in the day, um, about 220,000 of those will be genotyped using an, an array very similar to the, uh, uh, with, with, with some minor modifications similar to um, the global array or the African American array that uh, Neil had developed. Um, and then figuring out how to, um, to take that knowledge and bring it back to our clinicians. That's always our primary mission in the VA. So I think that, that much of what we talked about has been very um, applicable. Um, and uh, we have those 250 are consented. Um, it's a trust model that will allow for some evolution. And we've built in some of the things that we've heard uh, earlier today, like the ability to recontact and actually survey individuals and potentially opt in or out of return of information as um, the field evolves. Um, but there's an awful lot to, um, to, to moving that into the implementation range, even within one healthcare system. So if I could have my next slide, I think that you know, some of the issues that we've heard today are echoing themes. And I'm going to be very brief. There's um, various levels of institutional buy-in. And it sounds like you all have gotten institutional buy-in. Um, one, one thing I've learned about buy-in when we move um, knowledge from the research side of the health to the clinical side of the health within the VA or within partners, which is the system that I also live in here in Boston, is that there's buy-in at various levels. Um, and I think we have to think about it. We've talked about it today. Um, there's overall buy-in at the top. And then there's sort of clinical leadership buy-in. There's buy-in from the informaticists who have to um, help us with the implementation. And, and that's one issue that we have struggled with. Um, uh, in the VA, and, uh, particularly because this can be some, sometimes resource intensive and we may not be able to, to pay for that, that implementation aspect. Um, then there's, there's buy-in at the, the, at, at the user end, the, the clinician end, and, and so certain, certainly understanding their needs, understanding how they um, utilize things, understanding their stressors, understanding the fact that they get many reminders, alerts, and, and other um, realms of clinical decision support are often in play and we're, we, we, you, we may be competing with other aspects of clinical decision. And then the buy-in at the patient level um, to the extent that, that these things are accessible in a patient portal. Um, number two is system heterogeneity. And we've talked a lot about that today. And so I don't think we need to go into great detail. Um, I think that certain of the vendors are um, less uh, amenable to modifying their um, their um, platform, and so we talked about one solution today, which is um, to make sure that the the um, institutional leaders that are buying from these vendors speak with a unified voice to try to get to try to pressure um, certain vendors, particularly the big ones that are rolling out now in in, cookie, in really cookie cut, cookie cutter fashion um, EMRs that are going to be laid over. Um, and I, and you know, one thing that th is being dealt with in partners is that um, there is a general sense that the modifiability of some of these, um, uh, in, is, uh, what I'm going to say is big EMR um, vendors uh, is, is uh, perhaps not what some of the, um, the local implementers would, would like to see. Um, then uh, you know the, how how are these how customizable are these um, and uh, how that could ex, you know ex, uh, impact the aggregate experience if we want to learn from that in aggregate you know if we end up with customized systems that um, where the information whether it be process outcomes or not are are um, useful locally um, will that translate across the systems and and uh, um, what, what does this, how does this compete uh, in terms of appearance and other things with other clinical decision support? The nice thing is that there is, in most institutions, 
um, individuals who um, in the non-genomic world have been involved in this clinical decision support arena for quite some time. I think I have my last slide and we'll just finish up and then turn things over to the, uh, some of the other panelists. So um, uh, I think that it's important, that, yeah, my only comment here is, and we can discuss in general next steps, is, is moving from process-based outcomes which are easier to measure. You can measure how many times a test was ordered or um, how many times a report was read, um, how, how much informa information was utilized in a given clinical situation. A little bit harder is, the, is, is then turning, is turning toward uh, clinical outcomes. I mean, does this really do what the health system wants to do, make patients healthier? Um, uh, you know, uh, other system outcomes, such as, um, you know, improving efficiency of care, um, uh, uh, often put in the context of the health of the individual. And what that means is that we have to phenotype individuals on the back end and phenotype in real time if we want to look at, you know, who has, who has less bad outcomes when they've utilized a, a, clinician, a, a clinical decision support tool. So um, as often, uh, I would talk about a lot of this today, and there's a lot to think about. And um, I think it's it, it's um, time to turn to the other panel members. Um, and and since they're listed in alphabetical order, I'll suggest we go Irwin, Ken, and Lucilla, if that's okay. Irwin, are you on mute? Your turn, Irwin. Um, if if Erwin Erwin is Erwin is uh, warming up, maybe we can just turn to Ken. I I, I know Ken's on because I see him uh, chatting. Ken sent me a message saying he is muted by the organizer. So um, Brandy, could you unmute Ken? Hello, can you hear me? That's it. Great. Um, no, I, I, um, I think everyone's points were um, uh, really good, um, um, but you just have a few comments. Um, so one aspect is um, I think overall, just from a high-level view, I think it's important to um, do to make uh, CDS for pharmacogenomics and for genomics in general attractive from an operational standpoint. So I'm I, sort of my day job now is more operational. Um, I'm an associate CMIO at my institution now, and you know you sort of see what. Um, sort of how the operations and the health system tends to look at some of these decisions more. And um, I think there it's really important to think of how can you make this so that the 10 or 20 or 30 second elevator pitch to your the hospital admin w makes this um, more attractive. And I think there's probably two components of it. Uh, one is to increase the value. So how can this solve a problem that is um, near and dear and at the top of the, an organization's um, operational priorities. And I think there, um, we talked about process and needing to go to clinical outcomes. I think also going to cost effectiveness is important. Um, like we have a paper that's pending publication in uh, BMC Medical Informatics that, uh, where we systematically reviewed clinical distance support for the inpatient setting looking for cost effectiveness. And essentially we found there's almost no data. And I think, you know, if you're making a case to um, clinical administrators, why we should invest in pharmacogenomics for distance support in an operational sense in terms of going widely. What you need to do is show that this can be cost effective in, in, um, in what you're uh, looking at. So I think that's important. And then the other part that folks have been talking about in terms of using standards, et cetera, I think that relates to decreasing cost. And I think um, it simply is hard, like the CDS consortium example was a, a good one. It's hard to do a lot of these things. and. If you couple, it's uh, we don't yet have cost effectiveness data on um, the b impact of these kind of efforts on the bottom line, and also we don't have, and moreover, the cost of implementation is relatively high and is a, a relatively big demand uh, on, say, your hospital IT group. I think that's a challenge. So I think, sort of from a high level view, looking to show cost effectiveness and looking to come up with approaches, whether it's using standards services, et cetera, or using available tools in a, uh, the commercial EHR system without too much need for adjustment 
figuring out how to decrease the cost of implementation I think would be important. And I think when you have research um, uh, funded through something like Emerge where you really can, um, you know, take the time to really figure out how to make it scale, how to, you know, research cost effectiveness, I think that could be a really great outcome if you can, one of the outcomes is we've shown and we have very easily available now information you can provide to your IT group to say to implement this, it only takes these steps and requires 20 hours from this kind of person and you're done. And moreover, we've shown that in this type of a setting, this is going to reduce your costs, whether in, you know, a capitated or uh, ACO type of setting. I think if you can do that, then um, it'll sell itself and it'll disseminate widely. Yeah, I, I would I second that, that that's critical. I mean, as these, you know, big health systems are moving toward, you know, global risk, it, uh, there are going to be a, a lot of pressure to use their informaticists to do uh, well-proven clinical decision support that's going to improve the health and lower costs, improve efficiency of the healthcare system. Um, so we're we're going to you know whatever comes along in this space is going to be competing with with that activity. And if you can demonstrate some some efficiency, I think that that's a uh, a real advantage to um, getting the attention and resources that you need to get it implemented. So I um, I think that uh, that Erwin was muted and he's back on now. So Erwin, do you have comments? Yeah, I, I agree with most all things that have been said. I want to add a few uh, uh, points to that. And one is when it comes to uh, EHR integration and clinical decision support, I think there's broad agreement uh, across the network and beyond uh, uh, on this panel today that clinical decision support is sort of the main vehicle to focus on. And when it comes to clinical decision support, uh, it's a very difficult undertaking, as Mark pointed out uh, in his opening remarks. Uh, I think going forward, uh, what we uh, might want to consider more than what we have to date is to actually bring uh, some selected practice leaders, clinical practice leaders into the fold because one of the key elements to uh, successful clinical decision support and then uh, certainly also downstream, uh, you know, collecting and measuring meaningful data is that we have a decision support that really integrates exceedingly well uh, with clinical workflows. And so we have now done this in the pharmacogenetics uh, implementation sphere that was outlined earlier for Emerge and beyond here at Mount Sinai, but also in um, with the APOL1 clinical decision support as one of our genomic medicine demonstration projects. And we found that even within one health system such as Mount Sinai, and having 130 physicians uh, involved in our programs, the various programs, uh, these are a number of different practices and practice types that, you know, each group of physicians in the different practice types, whether it's private uh, practice style faculty practice or whether it's the clinic or whether it's a community network clinic, each of those practices has a very different perception of the decision support that is the same text that we presented to them. So I think, you know, going forward, certainly this is sort of probably one of the main vehicles for us to uh, play in implementation. I think what we uh, might want to consider bringing more into this uh, uh, focus is sort of a direct reach into uh, those folks that are sort of opinion leaders, etc., in different clinical practice settings and that will then obviously be driven from an email 3 perspective um, from uh, by the point of what what kind of areas we are focusing on or would might want to focus on for implementation. But I think that is something that might be from a very practical perspective going forward uh, very helpful uh, in a um, you know comprehensive approach to a focus on clinical decision support and uh, having it optimized for uh, clinical adoption and then being able to make meaningful measurements uh, from the implementation of that. Great, thanks. And Lucilla? 
Uh, yeah, well, I agree with uh, all my colleagues, and I, I would like also to point out that uh, the modifications to the EHR that clinical decision support needs to make are not that different from the ones that uh, researchers need to make, for example, to implement trials, to um, facilitate recruitment, and so on. So, so uh, there is a lot of need from the research as well as the clinical communities. Uh, the clinical community obviously will have much more of an impact uh, in asking uh, for such things, but, uh, but I think a unified front would be of uh, much uh, influence because when you're selecting eligibility criteria and so on, it's not that different in, in terms of research or in terms of uh, recommending the the right uh, thing to do for a particular patient. One thing that I think is no surprise that pediatrics and oncology have um, done more in this area, uh, I believe, uh, is because of clinicians uh, are more um, educated about genomic medicine in, in many cases as well as uh, the patients being uh, more informed or, or their parents being uh, more seeking of such opportunities. Uh, I think the opportunity to leverage uh, PCORnet, which is newly formed and just had its kickoff meeting this week, uh, is tremendous. And the lessons learned from Emerge could definitely pass on so PCORnet doesn't make the mistakes or go in routes that you've already shown that won't work. Uh, and hopefully vice versa as this clinical uh, and patient power research networks proceed. So I, I think I'm, I'm very pleased to hear uh, that we're moving in the right directions. Great, thank you. And I think now is the time for our open forum on this topic, if anyone else has anything to add. Uh, this is Ita Berner. I was going to add, picking up on what Erwin said, is that we tend to talk about uh, clinical decision support or EHR use has to fit into the clinical workflow as if it is the clinical workflow. And in fact, there are many, many different workflows, often individual physicians within a, a given clinic. And we need to take that into account. Right, I think that's important and, uh, and I, I completely agree that having clinician buy-in and all clinicians are not the same is critical as, it, as the, the clinical decision support tools are being developed. Um, other thoughts or comments? Um, this is Peggy Peisig from Marshfield Clinic, and I just wanted to comment on something that Ken said. Um, cost effectiveness is definitely one way of selling this to, you know, operations, but the way that Marshfield has done it in addition, well, we haven't done it by cost effectiveness, but we've taken it actually under patient safety and sold it that way. So that's another approach that may be worthwhile in investigating. Yeah, and in addition, hitting quality metrics. I mean, if, if, we're, yeah. if you're meeting standards, meeting guidelines, it's another, another important consideration. Yeah, this is Mark. I wanted to make two points related to what Peggy said that are, I think that's really important. Uh, we have a couple of opportunities within what we've curr we're currently doing uh, to take a patient safety approach. One relates to something that came up briefly on today's um, uh, webinar, but uh, was really uh, a focal point for the global medicine meeting that many of us were at last week, which is a prevention of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. While these are relatively rare events, they uh, incur a huge cost to the system. And at least for some populations, there's a, a big opportunity uh, for prevention. So that would be one example of a major problem that could be presented from a patient safety perspective. The other one is if we can figure out the genotyping uh, issues on CYP2D6, um, hospitals are being beaten about the head and neck on pain control for patients, but also on safe use of opiates. And I think we have something to contribute in that um, uh, discussion uh, that could be helpful uh, as we sort of ping pong between those two extremes. Uh, and that would be something that would uh, be attention getting uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the leadership. Um, 
The other point relating to some of the economic discussions before, you know, when we tend to think about economics, we tend to think about, you know, looking at things from a national perspective and qualities and, and a very academic approach. What we're really talking about here are economic studies from the perspective of the healthcare delivery system itself, which is a very different methodology uh, and is something that um, uh, there are very few groups that are really uh, doing, but I think we would have an opportunity to take advantage of what we're doing to look at it from a very different perspective, uh, which would contribute to the conversation about why this should be implemented. Yeah, I, can, I completely agree. It, it, it is a, It will become, you know, as we move to these risk contracts, it, it's the economics of the health system that is going to drive, you know, what their EMR looks like and what they're just directing their physicians to be doing. Um, this, so this I'd, like very... respond, uh, I'd like to respond to Mark uh, talking about the tip 2D6 and opiates. That situation might be so complicated, and it's so complicated even on the genomic end, that a, an assay that measured how that metabolism happens on a practical level per patient might be the only way to really get to the bottom of it. It looks, as in our superficial way of looking at uh, how complex the genomics are related to how the metabolism actually happens, is not that strongly predictive. And hence, a, a more practical approach that's non-genomic might actually be something that would be more useful in terms of the clinical application. And just to say, you know, the genomics is not necessarily the end all for the way we solve all the clinical problems. Um, this is Mary. I, I wanted to, um, well, I guess first of all say I do think that for CYP2D6, one can easily identify the 10 percent of the population that are poor metabolizers. I know there's a lot of confusion for some other findings, but the vast majority of 2D6 high-risk patients can be identified with relatively simple tests, and that's allowed our hospital to leave codeine on the formulary for patients that have permissive genotypes, which has really helped with the opiate prescribing problem that you were referring to. The one thing I was thinking as you're talking about using safety instead of cost effectiveness to be the primary driver behind the CDS initiatives, which is also what we've done at our institution, do, would you emerge institutions be able to summarize what the majority of your interruptive CDS is currently and how, how, what the added burden of CDS related to genomic testing will be? I mean, we found out as part of our genomic implementation that we needed to do a better job of tracking what all the interruptive CDS is that we have ongoing, but the vast majority of it is, that's customized is patient safety related, and we find that our institution is very willing to support efforts to create that CDS, whether it's genomically based or otherwise. Yeah, Mary, that's a really good point because the whole concept of alert fatigue is one we're well aware of. I think, though, some of it also relates to not only the the current burden within our institutions, but are there other ways to do it uh, rather than an interruptive alert? You know, the example for simvastatin, you know, in my view, the, the uh, you know, if you went into a statin prescription and you had the, the star 5 genotype, Simvastatin wouldn't appear on the pick list, and the only time you'd get an alert would be as if you tried to type in Simvastatin, and then it would say, hey, there's a reason we didn't show you this on the pick list. Um, and so I think there are different ways that we might be able to um, do this without interrupting workflow and look, look at that as our only solution. That's true, but there's a lot of genomic CDS that will be dose-related, not choice of drug-related, so you're still going to have to have alerts for a lot of genomic findings in pharmacogenomics. Well, not necessarily, because when we uh, did our uh, warfarin studies at Intermountain, um, what we did was the process for dosing warfarin uh, using clinical um, uh, features was already in the hands of the pharmacologists, and so uh, the clinicians were just seeing a dose, and so when we did our randomized controlled trial, it was simple for the pharmacologist to in use the genomic dosing algorithm along with the clinical uh, features, and again, the clinicians just saw the dose, so it made absolutely no difference to them 
the fact that we incorporated genomics in that particular type of a workflow. So I think studying workflow design and not just always defaulting to an alert is an important thing. Mark, could I ask a different question to Susan? Uh, most of what you all have presented about is CDS and related issues once information is already in the EHR. But I wonder if you guys could back up and link more explicitly to the issues just before your panel. Because, you know, in genomics and in eMERGE, you've got to worry about this translational process of how do you structure the flow of information into the EHR? When is it ready for that move? How is that governed? I wonder if any of you could reflect on that for a second. Well, certainly at Geisinger, we have uh, dealt with those issues relating to our implementation of um, IL-28B genotyping uh, for our patients with chronic hepatitis C uh, in terms of uh, treatment regimens. Um, and so as we uh, decided um, clinically that this was desirable and that this information would be usable, um, we had to solve all the different problems, which is, first of all, how do we make sure the genotype gets done because we do not have preemptive genotyping for those individuals, and we used a standardized order set that included genotyping to uh, reduce the barriers to trying to remind clinicians to actually order it. And then uh, the issue was once it was ordered and we did the genotyping, which we were doing in-house, we had to develop a manual process to be able to represent the IL-28B genotype as well as the viral genotype as structured data within the EHR so the, um, um, rec uh, the uh, medication recommendations would uh, be able to run. And uh, so we develop, developed a manual solution to that, and we now have, you know, a process that's essentially running in 100 percent compliance. But that's a one-off, and, you know, so we have to get over the fact that um, to solve some of these problems rather than keep building one-offs. And I wonder um, how that looks across all the eMERGE sites. Uh, it seems to me there's a comparative opportunity there because this is a core question that has to be solved in a more standardized way. So we are looking at that in the, e that's part of our EHRI outcomes um, uh, measurements is to be able to look at how people are actually doing some of those things. And the hope is, is that as we aggregate that information, that will provide us some opportunities for standardization. But as been mentioned, the challenge that we have is still ultimately we're dealing with vendors and whether or not they would be amenable to modifying uh, their product to represent what we think is the best way to do it. So just a reminder, we have about one more minute on this topic. This is Ken. Maybe if I could do a quick comment on that notion of um, uh, uh, what to do scalable. I think first, just one point is, Vendors actually oftentimes do provide extension points, and I know some folks have already um, exploited those. And I think uh, one approach is to just say what's currently supported and let's figure out a way to be able to scale on that. And another point is just um, uh, the, this notion of scaling CDS is something that's of general interest to the ONC and a, has been a priority for, uh, for example, for development for meaningful use stage three proposed criteria. Um, I uh, coordinated uh, one of those efforts called Healthy Decisions to develop some of these standards. And there's still a lot of interest at ONC, CMS, et cetera, to, you know, uh, develop these standards to make them scalable, to make, to solve this problem essentially for all of medicine, not just personalized medicine. And I think um, uh, doing whatever is possible to align with that would be a great thing, in particular because um, uh, the idea is then this, these would be industry standards, uh, maybe part of meaningful use, and therefore implemented in all EHR systems, et cetera. And um, just aligning forces with uh, these um, efforts that are really trying to solve the same problem, just um, not necessarily focused on uh, uh, pharmacogenomics. Okay. Well, we'll take this uh, pause in a, what has been a very good discussion. And sorry, Justin, we're going to move on down now to uh, 